passing, what I should say, tell me what he was into, um, to uh, um, introduce him today. He said to me, with characteristic wisdom, <laughs> just tell them how we met. And I realized that that really was wise, because Steve is his own persona. And you will find out what Steve's into very easily by listening to his talk. Because Steve Hassan is a man who makes waves wherever he goes. He's a man who has unparalleled un, uh, wisdom, opportunity, and uh, the ability to communicate with people. And I know that you're going to get a great deal from uh, this uh, talk. So, Steve, thank you, Bill.
take the worst phobia that you can think of at a cult, puts in your head, and there it is. You know, you, you are being thrust into a situation where they're going to steal your soul. <laughs> it's the ultimate <laughs> test of reality. They're going to steal your soul. So um, I resorted to my movie persona. I kept saying, you don't have an appointment. Call my office, and we'll set up an appointment to talk next week or the week after. And they weren't leaving for that. <laughs> and they just kept barraging me. And the more they did, the more angry I got, and the more entrenched I became, and the more sure I was right being a loony. So speeding it up, because you're not here to hear my story, but to hear about my approach and where it is in 2011, uh, I hadn't called in to do the group as prearranged, so they knew something bad was happening. They were sending people to come rescue me. Uh, my father had to get me out of the house. He convinced me to get into the car to go see my mother, who was another person who never criticized me. He just, she would just you know, love me up. She was one of those types of wonderful Jewish moms. Um, I figured if I could get access to her, I could convince her to release me from this horrible, satanic, communist conspiracy. And anyway, then I'm in the a car, driving on the Long Island Expressway, my guests are up on the back, my dad's driving, and we missed the exit to where my, my home is, where my parents' home was. And I think, see, you know, liar, he's not taking me to see mom. And I literally had the idea to snap my father's neck in a moving car for about five minutes. I was just thinking, just like that. And I thought about the car careening, maybe hitting some other cars, maybe killing some other people. Uh, and, but then somehow my cult self was said, you're never going to leave. You're going to be faithful. You can stand up to any test. Don't you know? Have faith in God. You can get through this. So I didn't do it, thankfully. We get to the next location where the deprogramming was going to be. And I saw some football. Uh, style bodies coming to get me, to bring me to the next location. And I basically just threatened to kill everybody. <laughs> I had learned some Taekwondo in the group. Uh, I was going to be very violent. And my father knew, I grew up in the hardware business uh, that my father had. So I used to pick up 100 pound bags of rock salt and thread pipe with my hands and other things like that. So, the battery fell. Uh, where was I? Right, so the, the, that your, your mother and I will be able to sleep at night knowing we did the responsible thing. So in other words, what he was saying was, do it for us, you know? Just let us go through this process so we can be reassured that you know what you need to know. Because I kept saying, I know everything. I heard all that negative stuff. I, I understand, you know, we'll let that, that cry. The do it, do it for us, one more time. Just show us. Um, and so it became voluntary. And, and if it wasn't, if, if it hadn't become voluntary, it wouldn't have worked. I'm telling you for a fact. I know myself pretty well. Um, and what was really interesting during those days was there were two teams of people, and I publicly want to thank them. I'm only going to thank them by their first names. People say, who got you? Well, one was a woman named Gladys who was had been my spiritual child. I had recruited her into the movies, and she was out. She was now a nurse, a social worker. A guy named Nestor, who's now a psychiatrist, who had been in the Moonies. Mike, who I'm not sure what he's doing these days. I've lost touch with him. And a fellow who wasn't, was never in a cult at all, a guy named Gary. And he was the key to my exit. Because Gary just made rapport with me and asked me how I was feeling and what do I think. What do you think, Steve? So they have teams of two. They do a presentation or they go over some point. I'd be blocking, 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 blocking. Then he'd come in, what do you think, Steve? And I'd be like, I don't agree with this. I, I do agree with that. That doesn't work. You know, 
you know, if they're trying to get me out by the Bible, forget it, because I'm Jewish and like the New Testament, that's not where I'm, I'm there at all. Then so, so in other words, what was happening without my awareness at all was my unconscious was teaching them how to rescue me. I did, I, it took years after I left to realize when I really tried to analyze how did this thing work. Part of it was being away from the group. Part of it was meeting with former members who had left the group and were happy. And in my books, I talk a lot about phobia indoctrination being an essential piece of destructive mind control. The implantation of irrational fears or the utilization of existing irrational fears that if you leave the group, terrible things are going to happen to you. And in releasing the bonds in chapter 10, I have four pages of the most common phobias I've encountered in my career of 36 years. That if you leave, you're going to be possessed by demons, that you're going to be hit by a car, that your parents will die of heart attacks, that you'll never be happy, that you'll be a drug addict, a prostitute, I mean, you, you'll go insane. So the idea is, is that members of mind control cults, because of this phobia implantation, they can't imagine leaving and being happy and fulfilled. They can only generate negative scenarios. And it's hardwired to their emotional survival responses. So, um, so I lost my train of thought. Where was I before I got off on the thing? Gary. Gary, yeah, thank you very much. Someone's listening. <laughs> so what was what was happening was I had my real self hidden under this cult self, and that's another very essential theme of my model is that that this indoctrinated self, which in my second book I know a lot of people read my first. In my second book, I talk about parts, particularly child parts that get recruited by the cult identity. And, we, and during the questions and answers, I can go into much more detail about that. But it was my cult self being the true believer, thinking the cult thoughts, and behaving <coughs> that way. But it was my real self that had basically been 19 and a half when I was recruited. I grew up in a, a, a family where my parents never divorced. They didn't smoke, drink, gamble. They lived in the same house. If anything, they were born. They were like so regular. My mom was an art teacher. My dad had a hardware store. He played music. I had close friends. It was like I had a stable sense of self before. So I had this, it wasn't like some people who get recruited when they're seven or they're born into it. I had a self to go back to. I want to be a college professor. I, I was writing poetry and short stories. For me, creativity was the essence of what it meant to be a human being. And yet within, I don't know, a month, they had me throwing out my poetry, saying, you know, using the biblical story of, of, uh, of uh, Abraham being asked to sacrifice his son, and would I, would I sacrifice my Isaac? Only, unlike the biblical story, my, my stuff died in the garbage can. It wasn't like a biblical story where the son continued to live. In any case, there I was unconsciously instructing because I wasn't being talked at. Well, some of them were talking at me, but somebody was listening. And I was giving them real feedback. It got to the point where on the fifth day, the final day, or the fourth day, I got to the point where they were saying, Moves like Hitler. See, this, 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 this. And they really were in my face about it, which was the old deprogramming style. And I remember saying, I don't care if he's what moves like Hitler. I've chosen to follow him, and I'll follow him to the end. And as soon as I said it, I had a chill down my spine. So I'm a Jew, right? I was educated about the Holocaust. So again, this real self, cult self dissonance that was happening was very, very intense. And then the final straw that broke the camel's back that allowed me permission to start questioning consciously again, it allowed myself to, 
who we assumed the boss position from that lecture yesterday, the executive position, was they asked me to read one of Moon's speeches where he was like totally lying his face off. And I knew it as a leader. And, and, and just reading his words, they, and they just said, what do you think? So reading his words, I'm thinking of the hundred lectures I heard him personally do that contradicted that. Only after five days in this whole process, I just thought, what a snake, what a liar. And as soon as I allowed that thought, conscious thought, that he was a liar, it's like, if he's a liar, he's not trustworthy. If he's not trustworthy, how can I believe anything he says? You know, he was claiming Armageddon was going to happen in 1977. He was claiming that the world would be rid of poverty and crime and war and pollution, kind of this incredible fantasy of the ideal world, the Garden of Eden. The whole thing was like a house of cards. And then I just started crying for several hours. Because it was a snapping moment for me. I feel like I got snapped into the cult and I got snapped out of the cult. And I've basically been 36 years healing myself, <laughs> basically. You know, I'm still here uh, teaching about it, so I'm no longer in a place where I have any parts within me that still believe in moon or have any phobias about it. I have some fears that somebody's going to hurt me in one of these extremist groups. But aside from that, that's a rational fear, by the way, as opposed to an irrational fear. Um, I'm just incredibly passionate that something better has to come along and has to be developed. And I'm completely believing that the strategic interaction approach, which is what this talk is about, should be an open source model that everybody refines and makes better and finds new contexts to develop it because it's a process-based model. And you need to have certain theoretical <coughs> constructs, but even those constructs can be shifted or changed or abolished if something closer to the truth you know, becomes uh, apparent. So what I want to focus on in this talk, and then I'd like that there to be lots of questions and answers, is that what I want to say is that this is a complex systems, family and network oriented communication strategy that is directed to um, empowering people to have more resources. Intellectual resources, emotional resources, experiential resources. So that their true selves can have a voice and can have power and can act and do what he or she wants to do. Does that make sense? So people say, what is a cult? What, you know, what, for me, it's the, the behaviors of what makes a group uh, an unethical, unhealthy environment. And it can be the result of one person's influence. It can be a religious organization, or a political organization, or a therapy organization, or a business organization, or it can just be a person or a family system that's employing the bite model, controlling behavior, controlling information, controlling thoughts and controlling emotions. Those are the four components. I basically took cognitive dissonance theory, Leon Festinger's important theory, where he wrote the, the book When Prophecy Fails, about a doomsday cult. Who knew that, that um, Mrs. Keats had been an ex-Scientologist? I think I've learned that recently, this last uh, doomsday cult prophecy. In any case, um, he talked about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and if you change any one of these, the other two will shift to reduce dissonance. So if you want to, if, you, if you have an atheist uh, and you want him to be a believer, ask him to put their hands together and pray. And they may say, sure, why not? But if they're doing that behavior, it's actually going to create an attitudinal shift towards that belief that maybe there's a God. Because otherwise, why would you do it? Um, as one small example. Anyway, so thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and I added information. You 
you just flip it around, BITE, behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control, they're all on my website, freedomofmind.com, by model. You can go through the laundry list. And if you imagine a continuum of influence, they're being more destructive, they're being more healthy. The two poles are here is uniqueness, I'm going to do it this way. Uniqueness, individuality, free will, creativity, connection to family and friends. Here, dependency, obedience, cloning, authoritarianism. Here, control of information. Here, free press. Talk to whoever you want to talk to. Make up your own mind, those polls. And you can go literally down the laundry list. The more a group changes people's names, the more they change their clothes, the more they change their language, the more, the more they need to ask permission for major life decisions, the more ticks you can make, the more, the more it goes in this direction. So it's, it's, it's non-ideological in that sense. It's just really looking at behaviors. What is happening? And information control is one of the more, more obvious ones, because legitimate groups, the ones on this side, will tell you up front who they are, what they believe, and what they want from you. Before they ask you to join or make a commitment. And the unhealthy ones will only give you, spoon feed you, little by little by little, love bomb you, do mystical manipulation, all kinds of other tricks. And you may not, you may be in a group for 20 years and still not know what the upper levels are of doctrine. Because information is control. And I operate on the basic assumption that if it's true, it will stand up to scrutiny. If it's true, it will stand up to investigation. If it's not true, whoop, you know, leave or find another, another uh, uh, truth. I also believe that the more grandiose the claims a particular person or group makes, the more grandiose the proof has to be before anyone even remotely considers it. So the burden of proof is on them to prove it, not on us to disprove it. The groups over here practice love, love of beingness, love of life, loving people who believe differently than you because they're people. Here, it's all conditional love. We'll love you if you do what we tell you to do. And if you don't, then you're not worthy of love. And then that's a little bit about emotional issues. But the point is, it's not, it's not mystical. It shouldn't, you know, this model is very much grounded in the social sciences. Um, I did an interview with Philip Zimbardo, who did the Zimbardo prison experiment. Uh, he's a famous Stanford professor, and he was uh, president of the American Psychological Association in 2002. And, um, he taught a course at Stanford called The Psychology of Mind Control for 15 years. And it has the text where the, the citations were this. He used two chapters from my first book. And I, I uh, sat down, I did an interview, I think it was around 1997, and I recently put it on my, my website, my Vimeo uh, branch of my website. I just sat him down and said, can you tell people who say there's no such thing as mind control, what your opinion is, and he basically just reviewed the literature. And he said, you know, that social psychology, of course, does influence. And then he reiterated behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. And, and it's real. It's a fact. Um, and I also want to mention the person who did the probably the most significant therapeutic intervention with me early on when I left the Moonies. Anyone want to guess? Anyone read my book? Robert J. Lifton, uh, who's former Air Force military intelligence, was researching brainwashing in China, is, is the classified version of his book, is called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. And that was one of the main pieces in my intervention that made me start thinking. Because as a Mooney, I was indoctrinated to hate the communists, because that was Satan's army. So I was happy to learn about what brainwashing was in China. 
Only when he went over milieu control, mystical manipulation, sacred science, doctrine over person, it was like totally about the Moonies. <laughs> totally. Well, anyway, I called him up three months after I got out. I said, Dr. Lipton, I want to talk to you about thought reform of the psychology of totalism. He said, that old book? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I just got out of the Moonies, and it was instrumental in helping me. He said, come and see me. And I sat down uh, at his uh, apartment. And I explained how the Moonies recruited the three-day workshop, the seven-day workshop, the 21-day workshop, the 40-day workshop, the 120-day workshop, how we you know, looked three, in three inches into people's eyes, the whole thing. He said, Steve, you have to understand, I have just studied this second hand by interviewing people, but you lived it. They did it to you, and you did it to others. So you need to study psychology and explain it to people like me. I went from this depressed, embarrassed, ashamed, college dropout ex-Mooney to hearing this Yale psychiatrist say, you have something valuable here. And it was, it's called a therapeutic reframe. <laughs> you take the experience, it's like lemons into lemonade. So I wanted to also acknowledge him and thank him. He has a new book out, uh, Witness to an Extreme Century. It's a memoir. He's written a book on the Nazi doctors, all about mind control. He's written a book on Aung Shinrikyo, Destroying the World to Save It. He's really worth studying. Um, how are we doing on time? About half an hour right now. Stephen, yes. this battery is running low soon. <laughs> <laughs> Should so I, I put this, with, this one in? Yeah, uh, I guess you maybe need to move it to another yeah. location. Yeah, I thought it might be mind. a good point to do it now. I've, I've learned a lesson about the, uh, the voltage situation in hotels in Spain. It's a shame because I want to put it up on the website. So should we just take two minutes uh, to... Yeah, take two minutes and just plug it in the back and do extreme zoom if you don't mind. Yep. Um, um, so while he's doing that, anyone want to ask a quick question that I can incorporate into the talk? Do you have another camera out there? Maybe they have a battery. Uh, I don't know. The first is all things. And you mentioned that one during the talk, you will reassess the things which are in the room, and probably, as we know, probably in the prison or so on. But it's really easy, right? Now, what about concept after you did the concept? Does it survive or does it die? Uh, or did it die? And uh, it will not die on its own, in my opinion, unless you process it. Even if you try hard, can you kill it? Absolutely. Well, you absorb it. You integrate it. I can come back to that and talk more about it. The resiliency of the human mind is amazing. It's part of how we get into destructive cults is our adaptability and our, our, our five senses that are interconnected with the environment. If we get into a healthy environment with very healthy individuals, especially if they're role modeling and mentoring these positive features, absolutely. It's not mystical. The cure to, to recovering from destructive mind control is to learn to control your own mind to learn to, to know your own mind and how it works and where its frailties are and, 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 and build up the resources. So I'm very optimistic and positive-minded about uh, the long-term prognosis. In fact, uh, I think those of us who have lost our freedom cherish it with such uh, vigor in a way that people who haven't lost their freedom can never appreciate life. Did I ask my second question? Uh, yes. You mentioned that uh, you face the lies of moms and then the you saw the contradiction between what he says and what he does and so on. But I'm you to 
Uh, it was a straw that broke the camel's back. I don't know that expression. It's the one little tipping point. Yeah. Bing. Then here I am going to ask you, because uh, in this point I prefer, because I call it ideological deception. So some people have called it heavenly deception. Means that members of the cult somehow are aware of this deception, are aware of these lies, and they accept it because. Yeah, we need to have a, a longer conversation. Yeah. I want to get into this, what the strategic approach is, because I assume a lot of people in this room want to know how do you help a friend, a loved one, get out of a mind control situation or group? At least that was my intention of this talk, was to try to describe my methodology, because truthfully, I'm 57 years old, I'm not going to live forever, and what I want to do is teach a lot more people what the methodology is. That's why I wrote this book 10, 11 years ago is to try to explain it and put it out there so that people can learn. Stephen? Well, Steve, yes, I was wondering if um, you can't abduct someone, which is what happened to you. Right. Um, do you have a technique, um, even if it's quasi-deceptive, of getting a relative or a friend of sort of infiltrating to the person if they're yeah, hard so to get me, at? Let me get into yeah. the approach, yeah. So what do you do? I, I made a public stand criticizing abduction and forced detention interventions. Um, I did. I was involved with a number of them in the 76 to 77. So what do you do? So what I start with is assemble a team of concerned family members, friends, and ex-members, and I educate them. Because I, I was mentioning earlier about creating a a strategic network, a complex system of people who understand what the issues are, what is mind control, what is undue influence, and understand the Achilles heels, basically, of the, of the system. Um, so, to just come back a second, in terms of my specific practice, I am a mental health professional. And so I have limitations of what my, my field allows me to do and doesn't allow me to do. So in some ways, it's good because I have legitimacy that I'm a mental health professional. And on the other hand, because of that, I can't lie to a client, <laughs> etc. So whereas lay professionals or ex-members, they have more latitude to be creative. I have to be in my ethical boundaries. Um, <clears throat> but I guess I'm, I'm much more of the position of immense gratitude that my family rescued me, that I got to only be in two and a half years. I could, I could still be there today. Uh, and um, I think it does make a big difference if someone comes out after two years versus five years versus 10 years versus 20 years or 30 years. And I don't believe in a hands-off, they're an adult, they say they're happy. Uh, I just, I understand that there's undue influence. The person was lied to, tricked, manipulated, and indoctrinated. They never would have chosen to join this group in my opinion, the groups that I deal with, if they knew up front what the group believed and practiced. So I am much more, some people say, Steve, you're, you're like, aren't you using the ends justifying the means because you're saying the groups use uh, influence? Aren't you doing the same thing in reverse? And I'm saying, in a way, I'm definitely, absolutely, hands down, I'm using influence. I get paid to use it, to be influential. People don't want to come to a therapist and not be impacted. They want change. They want something to happen that's going to be better than before they came in. But um, I guess ethically, I'm more along the lines of an, an, an ethics professor who was a parent that I worked with actually explained this to me years ago. She said, it's the lesser of two evils, Steve. You're, you, you may not be telling the cult member what everything you're doing, or you might be asking someone to covertly go meet someone, 
but it's it's evil, but it's not as evil as watching a loved one being a mind control call and not do anything. Especially in those cases where there's no communication, no direct communication with the family. So what I say to my 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 whole system is client centered. So it's the, the family in front of me and the unique constellation of the issues in front of me. And every family has its own strengths and weaknesses and its own network of resources. And I have to take each case on its own. And part of that is spending face-to-face -face time. I typically spend a couple of days. And I try to pressure family members <coughs> and friends to get to this meeting, even if they're not sure if they want to help or not. The only condition is that if they, if they agree to come, that they don't tell the cult member that the meeting is happening and such. They don't have to be part of the process, but they, that's the one condition. And if they don't want to be part of it, then you know, we leave them out of it, basically, because I consider it to be untrustworthy. But on my form, I have a list of questions, and I have a six-page form, just as an initial intake. But I ask, who's closest to the cult member? Who's willing to help? Who's not willing to help? And if, and, and if on the form, the person's closest is the sister, and the person not willing to help is the sister, then I know I need to make an intervention first with the sister. I need to figure out how can I approach the sister in a way that's going to be ethical, that's going to be effective to help them understand. And sometimes it's as simple as that sister being able to vent and say, I don't want to do it because mom and dad wants to do it, or I want to make sure my sister's doing it out of her own free will. And maybe meeting an ex-member of that particular group or, or learning a little bit more about mind control. But I'm always thinking step by step by step, what can we do? We may not know what over down there, except that we want the person to think for themselves, have their own feelings, and have free will. That's the goal. It's not to get them back to the Catholic Church or to the Jewish shul or to become an atheist like mom and dad. It's to empower them to have their own free will. That's the bottom line. So, this, so a lot of my approach is based on networking, my network of resources, the family's own network of resources, whatever geographical resources that I'm aware of, and how people can help each other. And um, so, and a lot of it comes down to communication techniques. So I do a lot of, of role playing and teaching what works, what doesn't work. Um, uh, so for example, my father read in the newspaper one day when I was in the movies that Moon had an M16 gun factory. Hey Steve, what kind of messiah has an M16 gun factory? <laughs> <laughs> so what did Steve the Mooney do? Crush the crush the blurred him he's in her third thing. Two parents, two parents, two parents. I did thought stopping. I did exactly as I was indoctrinated. Satan was trying to attack me. Attack father. Big father. My father's intention was to wake me up. He, he knew I was smart. I had skipped eighth grade. I was an extra on the classes. He just showed me the facts. So to wake me up. Wrong, made me deeper in the group, and made me more afraid of him because it's now Satan that possessed him. Get it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Intentionality isn't the criteria; it's how the person reacts. That's the criteria of communication. And what you want to do clearly is rapport and trust building, always first. Second. Gathering information, meaning asking questions about what the person is thinking, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing from a non-judgmental place. Just, I'm curious, help me to step into your shoes. What do you think about this? What do you, how do you feel about that? And it's when you have that foundation and that knowledge, then you can do what I call freedom of mind techniques. The three-step phobia intervention, the step out of your shoes into someone else's shoes, any number of other techniques. But the average person, they, they just want to go for the punch. They want the home run. They, want to, they don't have this, they don't have this, and therefore it's counterproductive. Like my father wanted the, the knockout. 
you know? Because in, in the Jewish religion, the Messiah brings peace, not, you know, automatic weapons. So how can my father have communicated that in a way that would be more along the lines of I could transport myself back to 1974 and whisper in his ear? I would have him call up and say, hey, Steve, I want to come and visit. My family never visited the call. Too afraid. I would have coached them to have dinner and smile and sing some of the songs together. I would have made sure that they were coached to what to expect so they wouldn't get recruited themselves. But they would have done things to establish rapport first. They would have talked with ex-members, learned the loaded language, which words to avoid, because it would bring up the thought stopping or whatever. And then based on that rapport, my father then could have called me up and said, hey, Steve, I've got a problem. Oh, I've got a problem. How can I help Dad? Well, so-and-so, you know, at shul, or so-and-so at work, asked me a, a, a question, and I, and I just couldn't figure out how to answer it. Oh, OK, Dad, well, what was the question? Well, this guy over here, read in the newspaper that Moon had an M16 gun factory. And he challenged me and said, what, I thought your son was following the Lord of Love and the Lord of Peace. What kind of guy has a gun factory? And I didn't know how to answer him. What would you advise? So the, me, the Mooney, is being respected, I'm being asked my opinion, I'm being given the information, which I didn't have as a Mooney. In fact, when I went after that phone call, they said, no, no, it's a BB gun factory. No, BB guns are different than a you know, uh, military weapon. But the point is positioning. And are you lifting the person up and connecting with them in their true self? out of love and truth, or are you trying to shake them, wake them up, you, you know? <laughs> He's got a flicky continental, and you're sleeping on the floor. That's what they, my father would say, he'd say things like that. You're eating peanut butter and jelly, and he's in five-star hotels? I don't, I don't get that, Steve. How come you gave your money to him? He's wealthy. That wasn't my mindset. He was the Lord. I had to do what God wanted to do. He didn't know how to enter my model of reality. And if you're going to be an effective communicator, you have to understand the model of reality of who you're talking to. And so if you're talking to a cult member, you need to understand how they've been indoctrinated. And as I said, ex-members are your, one of your biggest assets to tell you what the beliefs are and how they're indoctrinated. Because ideally, as you're thinking about how to communicate, you want to you want to imagine, if I say this, they're probably going to say that. And if they say that, I'm going to say that. And, but it's amazing how quickly people learn how to communicate effectively once they understand the rules. The rules are don't attack the leader, the doctrine, or the group directly. It'll only bring up thought stopping and fear. It'll only polarize it further. Talk indirectly about other groups. And if the person is connected to the internet or you are aware that they have a nine-to-five job at a normal place other than a normal place, every time there's a story about Scientology, or every time there's someone predicting the end of the world on May 21st, the Harold Campion group or something, it's an opportunity to ask, what do you think? What do you think about this group of selling all their, their belongings because the world's going to end on May 21st? How do you think they're going to feel on May 22nd? I'm curious. I'm not thinking about that. And when you ask a question, give a long pause. Because the goal is to get them to think, right? Most people ask a question and they go on within three seconds. Even if they're on a long distance call, you know, it's, even if it's free, long distance calls. But people are uncomfortable with silence. Get comfortable with silences when you're talking with a call member. Um, use personal examples. A lot of, a lot of, what did you do today? What's up with you? Start with telling about your day. 
the good things of your day, the not so good of things of your day, what you learned, to the extent that you can draw in things that you know their authentic self would have liked. Oh yeah, I got to see the Picasso Museum when I was in Barcelona. I got to see some of the earliest sketches. I wish you could be here, but it would be amazing. Um, so, you know, I can talk so much more, but I think I'm going to open it up to questions and answers because I have a feeling like I, I left out some key points. But I want to just summarize and say the strategic interaction approach means that it's a process-oriented, complex system, network approach to influence the person to be themselves. There's no bigger agenda than that. It's not to get them to go to a certain law school, a college, or a church. It's just for them to be able to think and act for themselves. And that there really are specific principles, the do's and don'ts, that I have found work better or not. And the one universal with people in cults is the cult identity thinks they know the truth, they think they're in the superior organization on the planet, and everyone else isn't. So talk about the other ones that aren't, and draw out the, and, uh, the parallels, but not too directly. Let them make the connections within themselves. Ask those gentle questions. Uh, and and, is, and in my, as in my intervention, if you have rapport and trust with them, they will tell you what they need to get out. They will tell you what they're missing or they'll tell you what's blocking them. And I tell you universally, phobias block people. For sure, guaranteed. And the lack of intellectual understanding of what mind control really is or how to tell the difference between a healthy environment and a, and a mind control environment. For sure. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up and let's do questions and answers. I'm only going to keep the camera forward, and I would recommend not giving your name or any identifying feature if you are actively trying to help a loved one. Because, uh, you know, this is going to be on the internet. So who hasn't asked a question yet? Yes. Um, would you have any practical suggestions for families, for small families? Where I come from, Holland, we have really small families, and, and religion in general is a big issue. Um, but it's kind of difficult to, to, to you know, because it's the one parent right. families, things like that. Right, so small, what's the, what do you do when there are a limited number of people in your immediate family? Um, and I would add, if you're, you know, you're divorced and the, your ex-spouse is remarried and not so much in touch, or you know, other kinds of complicated things, I tell all my clients, and it's a really good rule of thumb: think about a pie, or think about a circle, and think about the slice that you can do something about. Everything else is outside of your control and influence. But in reality, there's always a little area that we can do something about. Be very practical. Start from where you are. If you can have a friend that it can be a support for you, who can learn with you, that's another person in your network. Maybe they have family. Maybe one of their sisters have been in a cult or something like that. Maybe they can be taken. Maybe it's a childhood coach or teacher. Maybe, so you want to really think about stepping inside of the shoes of your loved one. Who were important people in that life? Or who potentially might they respect? And you may need to do many interventions with each of these people. Because uh, in my world, in my experience, people say to me, oh, his brother won't, won't help. He's pissed at him. He didn't show up for his wedding. He's supposed to be the best man. So the brother is angry. Understandably so, because he doesn't, he didn't understand cult mind control. He didn't understand the person didn't voluntarily go in the group. He was deceived, he was manipulated. So, to explain from people who've left who missed their own brother's weddings how terribly they feel because they didn't get permission to go to their brother's wedding, 
and that he shouldn't take it personal, and that in fact, I mean, for me, the analogy is akin to someone's in a mind control cult, they're in the middle of a lake, you know, with a, with a, a, a muscle spasm in their leg, flailing around. You, you can stand there and go, oh, I'm pissed at you because you didn't come to my, my wedding 10 years ago, or mom was in the hospital dying, and you wouldn't even show up. Or you can recognize it for what it is. The person's doing the best they can under the circumstances. They may say they're happy. They may, you know, make you feel like crap because they know the truth. But if you understand what is going on with these cult groups, you can have that perspective and compassion to say, no, they're they're in trouble. They may say they're fine, but you, you got to get out there and get them in a boat or throw a floater or something. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have a half an hour, right? So keep asking. Um, just before uh, you made a very clear definition about what your aim, what you, what your aim is, you say influence the person to be themselves. I think that is a similar definition to what my control is for you, a short, clear definition. Well, uh, I think you're asking me a definition of what destructive mind control is. What, what, what it is for you? Uh, such a clear and simple definition as you say what your aim is. What, what, oh, so for me, a simple, clear definition of what a destructive mind control environment is, it's a pyramid structured authoritarian relationship or group that uses deceptive recruitment so no informed consent, and behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control to make a new identity that suppresses the true identity and is obedient to the leadership. That's my media sound like. But I mean, uh, you need to be able to answer if your loved one says, so what, it, what, what is a cult anyway? You have to be able to say, well, there's some good cults and not so good cults. It all depends on the behaviors. Okay, what behaviors? Well, for example, healthy groups have free access to information. You can talk to anyone you want and decide for yourself. You can even talk to former members and hear for yourself what they have to say. Make up your own mind. Unhealthy groups, the leaders say stay away from those. They're spiritual pornography. They're evil. They're, they're commies, whatever. But you're an intelligent person. You have a good mind. You know how to discern what's true and what's not true. Get all the information in front of you, and you can figure it out. Because if it's true, it will stand up to scrutiny. Remember that? You'll hear me say that again. If it's true, the burden of proof is on them to prove how great they are, not on us to disprove it. 